Good morning. We'll go ahead and start the second of the morning sessions today. Uh, I'm Dave O'Connor from the Philosophy Department at Notre Dame. I'd like to introduce our two speakers. Uh, the uh, papers will both be delivered and then we will open the floor to questions. Uh, please do keep your questions as brief as you can to allow as much time as possible for more people to participate. Uh, our first speaker will be Sister Anna Stell, who's now a member of the Theology Department at Notre Dame after spending many years at Purdue University. The center of Sister Anne's work has been in medieval literature and theology, uh, though today she's going to talk to us about Henry James. Uh, uh, Sister Anne has now been at Notre Dame for a little over a decade. Uh, her office is just down the hall from mine, and I still think, her, think of her as a new kid. Uh, so that tells you something about the slow passage of time in the academic mind. Uh, but uh, I'm very much looking forward to her thoughts on Henry James. The, our second speaker will be uh, Vera Prophet, a uh, longtime professor in German at the University of Notre Dame. Uh, and uh, I'm thinking probably I seem like a new kid to Vera, since she has been around Notre Dame longer than me. Vera and I are actually neighbors. Uh, she, we live in the same neighborhood. and. Uh, she regularly strolls past my relatively leaf-free lawn, and I think I am probably at least a moral hazard and perhaps an occasion of sin because her own heavily forested lot is generally buried this time of year under some tons of deciduous compost. Uh, so I, I hope that by chairing the session, I repair some of the moral damage I've done to her over these many years. Uh, so the first speaker, Sister Ann Estelle, the title of her talk is Cut to the Heart, Compunction in Henry James, Altar of the Dead. Sister Ann. Thank you, David. In his important 1993 book, The Catholic Side of Henry James, Edwin Fussell argues that James, famous for his exploration of American-European relations, was equally or more interested in those between Protestants and Catholics. Embracing his own kind of religious liberalism, which entailed a charitable, vague tolerance to the Catholic Church and faith and people, the post-Protestant Henry James increasingly chose for himself the diplomatic role of representing Protestants and Catholics to each other, and of course, inevitably, to themselves. In so doing, James often plainly ventured, as he does in the altar of the dead, into a realm beyond his ken, employing an uprooted and imprecise religious vocabulary comprised of what Fussell calls sacred seculars, nouns like glory, temple, shrine, altar, mystic, pilgrim, unction, and halo, verbs like adore, guide, absolve, contemplate, sanctify, sacrifice, adjectives like silent, luminous, and immaculate. To Fussell's list, may be added an old-fashioned word, compunction. An electronic search of the Delphi Complete Works of Henry James reveals 37 instances of the word. Only in the altar of the dead, however, does the word appear on the page with a force that arguably recalls its root meaning and proper theological significance. Paying attention with the help of Rene Girard's mimetic theory to this one theologically loaded word in its narrative context enables us, I argue, to unify three different critical perspectives on James's uncanny tale, perspectives that have remained for the most part in separate silos, the cultural studies approach, the biographical criticism approach, and the formal approach. In Deceit, Desire, and the Novel, Gerard famously highlights the religious quality of the novelistic conversion 
evident in the conclusions of works of fiction by great authors who symbolically disavow the mimetic desire that has enslaved them to their models. In James's tale, the compunction of his hero, George Stransom, is a grace of conversion, in Girardian terms of novelistic conversion, with real life consequences for James himself as a writer who had been locked in an obsessive mimetic relationship with Oscar Wilde, his chief authorial rival. Funerals, cemeteries, and the unremembered dead. The Altar of the Dead was first published in 1895 in a collection entitled Terminations. A notebook entry dated September 29, 1894, spells out James's initial conceit for the story. I imagine a man whose noble and beautiful religion is the worship of the dead. It is the only religion he has, and it is a refuge and a consolation to him. He cherishes for the silent, for the patient, the unreproaching dead, a tenderness in which all his private need of something, not of this world, to cherish, to be pious to, to make the object of a donation, finds a sacred and almost a secret expression. He is struck with the way they are forgotten, are unhallowed, unhonored, neglected, shoved out of sight, allowed to become so much more dead. The man imagined here becomes James's hero in the tale, George Stransom, an unmarried man in his mid-50s who faithfully visits year after year the grave of his deceased fiancée, Mary Antrim. He goes on the anniversary of her death, and, and he who goes has an increasing number of other ghosts in his life. Entering a Catholic church, a temple of the old persuasion, at the close of a funeral mass, Stransom sits in a pew in the comforting glow of candles to warm himself and to rest. Then and there, he conceives a plan to erect a memorial for his ghosts in a dark and ungarnished side chapel within the church, and to assume the cost of burning candles there, one each for the deceased. A plan, we are told, to which a delightfully human Catholic bishop gives his approval. Starting with James's biographer, Leon Edel, scholars regularly observe that James wrote the notebook entry quoted above at 15 Beaumont Street in Oxford, in the very apartment where his friend, the writer Constance Fenimore Woolson, had resided. Woolson's death in Venice eight months earlier, on January 24, 1894, had greatly affected James, who believed she had committed suicide. James's sister Alice had died only two years before on March 6, 1892. These recent deaths evidently recall those of others dear to Henry James, notably his young cousin, Minnie Temple, and his mother, Mary Walsh, Mary Walsh James. James's immediate impulse was to take a trip to Oxford in 1894 with novelist Paul Bourget was moreover also explicitly memorial, intended as a tribute to Walter Pater, Oscar Wilde's famous teacher, who had died that same year on July 30th. Commenting later on the origin of the Altar of the Dead in a preface to the New York edition of his complete works, James insists that the basic motif of the story, the theme of a religious piety directed to the dead had somehow always been there. He goes on, however, to recount several incidents that had moved him to write the story celebrating one man's restorative reaction against certain general brutalities that were increasingly evident in the London of his day, when funeral rites were truncated and the mere mention of the dead adjudged impolite. 
alluding to, quote, the general bleak truth that London was a terrible place to die in, unquote, James frames his tale as a protest against, quote, the awful gloom of general dishumanization, unquote, that results in part from a cultural refusal of time and space for mourning and remembrance. Citing James Farrell's historical study of death obscuring phenomena at the turn of the century, Christopher Stewart describes James's altar of the dead as a prescient anatomy of morbidity rather than a morbid tale in itself. In that anatomy, the loss of memorials to the dead of tombs and of rites is itself symptomatic of a dying culture. Tracing the origins of primitive culture back to a sacrificial killing, Rene Girard has written, quote, culture always develops as a tomb. The tomb is nothing but the first human monument to be raised over the surrogate victim, the first most elemental and fundamental matrix of meaning. There is no culture without a tomb and no tomb without a culture." Unquote. Extending Gerard's argument to its apocalyptic end, one might worry with Henry James about all the cultural losses attendant upon the forgetting of the dead, or in Gerardian terms, the monumental misremembering, the misrecognition of them both as victims and victimizers. Stransom's misrecognitions. While James's conceit for the tale champions its hero, George Stransom, as an uncommonly sensitive, faithful devotee of the dead, a spokesman for James's own piety, the tale's actual implotment reveals Stransom to be a self centered man, mistaken in his judgments, selective in his remembrance, envious and unforgiving. A chance encounter on the street with an old friend, Paul Creston, who is just happily remarried, triggers Transom's harsh judgment against him as an unworthy spouse of his deceased wife, Kate, quote, who had been, of course, far too good for her husband, unquote. That same day, Stransom is shocked to read the obituary of Sir Acton Haig, a victim of a poisonous snake bite. Quote, the man who 10 years earlier had been the nearest of his friends, unquote. An unnamed catastrophe in their private relations, exacerbated by the horrible publicity attached to their quarrel, had ended their friendship and left Stransom's heart cold and hard like a stone. Stransom, we read, inveterately tried to rid himself of the memory of Acton Haig and firmly resolved, quote, for Acton Haig, no flame will ever rise on any altar of his, unquote. The themes of fraternal strife, snake bite, public shame and worship are obviously biblical. Recalling the story of the fall, that of Cain and Abel, but also the injunction in Matthew 523, quote, so if you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled with your brother and then come and offer your gift." Unquote. These same biblical themes are also favorites of Rene Girard, who sees the rivalry of brothers as symptomatic of the mimetic desire that turns opponents into doubles of each other through a process of misrecognition, reconnaissance. Stransom's misrecognition of Haig is itself doubled in the tale by his misrecognition of the unnamed woman who worships at his side in the church, taking silent solace in prayer before Stransom's candlelit altar. Taking note of her daily presence, Stransom draws comfort from it, imagining that she might be the one to maintain the altar after his death, when one more candle, his own, is added to it. 
The slowly building plot reaches its crisis when he discovers in a surprising twist that she has known, loved, and forgiven Acton Haig and is in fact remembering Haig at the very altar from which Stransom has stubbornly banished him. This factual discovery does not by itself, however, cure Stransom's misrecognition, which entails a high degree of self-deception. Stransom tells himself and his lady friend that he has forgiven Haig, whom he has actually disowned, refusing to number among his dead the man whom he had once almost adored, the only man with whom he had been intimate and to whom he had been passionately loyal. The sight of a framed photograph of Haig in the woman's apartment reawakens the old enmity with such a force that Stransom sees only Haig before him. Quote, Acton Haig was between them, unquote. The woman herself gradually and literally fades from sight in the story as both of them absent themselves from the church that had been their customary meeting place. To Stransom's old injury is added jealousy, envy, and a sense of betrayal. What Stransom imagines Haig to have done to the woman, quote, he had ruthlessly abandoned her, that of course is what he had done, unquote, is what Stransom himself does, albeit without realizing it. Haig's imagined past abuse of the woman in one way or another, the poor woman had been coldly sacrificed, only confirmed Stranson in the decision that, quote, he must leave him, Haig, out, unquote. At the cost, however, of leaving the woman also out and of losing even the altar itself before whom they had sat side by side. Ostensibly banishing Haig, he banishes himself. James has thus brilliantly constructed a story of self-defeating idolatry in which Stransom's one-time adoration of his model, Acton Haig, reveals itself to be at base of destructive self-worship, fueled in Girardian terms by the metaphysical desire to be what the idolatrous model is imagined to be. Critics reg regularly stumble over the festering subplot of Stransom's quarrel with Haig about the cause of which James tells us virtually nothing. Gourley Putt, for example, complains about the tale's silly tit-for-tat subplot, and Andre Varminsky, in an article dedicated to the memory of Paul de Mon, describes the altar of the dead as a story of, quote, mechanical dead repetition, revenge, and lame imitation, unquote. These critics, however, do not do justice to the compunctious end of the story, which surprised James himself, and which gains its full significance from the authorial crisis shattered forth in the parable-like subplot. Biographical critics have readily discovered in Stransom's lady friend a remembrance of Constance Fenimore Wilson, James' recently deceased friend and fellow writer. Following that line of thought, the candle-lit altar itself becomes a symbol of their common aspirations as artists. And Acton Haig, as Stransom's double, figures as an expression of James's own guilt for having abandoned Wilson in her hour of need, perhaps after having refused her the marriage proposal she desired. This interpretation has much explanatory power. Acton Haig is more than the shadow side of James himself, however. The trisyllabic Acton Haig recalls James's arch rival, Oscar Wilde, whose wife, Constance, was, like Fenimore Coop Wilson, a writer and a Constance, indeed a veritable embodiment of that virtue in her marriage with Wilde and in her much-tested forgiveness of him. Like Gabriel Nash Henry James, in Henry James's The Tragic Muse, Acton Haig in The Altar of the Dead is a character best described, to borrow a phrase from Michelle Mendelssohn, 
as a James Wild fusion, reflective of the monstrous Girardian interdividual that is a product of the mimetic doubling of rivals. The one more candle for which the woman pleads in recognition of the still exiled, unforgiven Hague merges with the one more candle Stransom desires in remembrance of himself. Compunction and conversion. Thematizing the communion of saints, although that phrase from the Apostles' Creed is not explicitly used in the story's interplay between the many and the one, James's altar of the dead extends the social dynamics Gerard discerns in human communities, causing them to crisscross the divide between this life and the next. The unrepentant Stransom expects his many dead to unite with him against the one he would exclude from their circle. But the dead, hallowed with candles at a side altar in a Catholic church, prove to have a life of their own beyond his control. Whereas in the operation of the scapegoat mechanism described by Gerard, the all unite in violence against the one, in the life of the communion of saints envisioned by James, the many beckon to the one the alien, the enemy, without the love of whom charity is imperfect. Through a grace of conversion, the rivalrous undifferentiation between Haig and Stransom suddenly turns into their ecstatic reconciliation. In the last pages of James's Altar of the Dead, Stransom is kneeling at the candlelit altar of his dead when the moment of compunction occurs. Given from on high, through the human beauty and human charity of the soul of Mary Antrim. Stransom, like another Dante, instructed by his own Beatrice, suddenly finds himself embraced by the glory of heaven in the smile of his long-dead fiance. Just as suddenly, however, his joy quickens to pain through, quote, some communicated knowledge that had the force of a reproach, unquote, as if Stransom had read what Mary's eyes said to him. Contrasting the very rapture of his experience with the bliss he had refused to another, Stransom realizes for the first time what he has done in excluding Haig and thus the lady from the altar of his remembrance. Quote, the descent of Mary Antrim opened his spirit with a great compunctious throb for the descent of Acton Haig. Stransom's compunction here is more than a feeling of guilt or shame. Compunction names the action of unmerited grace as a piercing, cutting, or wounding, as with a sharpened point, a punctus of the heart. A doctrine expounded by the Eastern Fathers, it gained currency and development in the West, mainly through the writings of St. Gregory the Great, the Church's most important expositor of the Book of Job. Like compassion, compunction entails one's identification with and as a sacrificial victim. But the manner of identification differs. The compassionate person can be innocent and recognize the victim's innocence, empathizing with him or her and standing vulnerable with the victim against the crowd. The compunctious person, by contrast, is always guilty and confesses guilt. His conversion, moreover, comes as a sudden recognition that he is guilty, often in a complicated way, of the very crime for which he has wrongly condemned another. The piercing of compunction has a literally atoning effect, making the victimizer at one with the victim. Explaining the grace of compunction in a closely related gift of tears the ancient expositors regularly turn to the example of the penitent King David, confronted by the prophet Nathan, and to passages in the Bible closely related to those informing Gerard's view of meconnaissance. The Latin verb from which the noun compunction derives, however, appears only once in the scriptures, in Acts 2 3, 7. There we read, that the assembled Jews listening to Peter preach in Jerusalem on Pentecost were cut to the heart, compunctis sunt corde, 
at Peter's word, quote, God has made both Lord and Christ this Jesus whom you crucified. Their, recognition, their misrecognition of Jesus suddenly ended. They asked the apostles in their fright, brethren, what shall we do? Peter responds, repent and be baptized every one of you for the forgiveness of sins. The moment of Stransom's unblinding, his conversion from reconnaissance, closely coincides with, quote, a miracle, the sweetest of miracles, unquote, granted instantaneously at a different place that very afternoon to the woman who had been, quote, the partner of his long worship, unquote. Sent by God, just then to the church, the woman tells Stransom joyfully, quote, on the spot, something changed in my heart. It was as if I suddenly saw something, as if it all became possible, unquote. Making his intention her own, she declares, I'm there for them, namely the multitude of departed souls remembered at Stransom's altar. Even as he, smiling at the sight of her, is quick to reply, well, they're there for you. They offer the very thing you asked of me, just one more. The bliss of their reunion, however, is short-lived. The faint of the ailing Stransom, overcome with joyful emotion, in front of the altar, portends his death. The tale ends with an image resembling the Pieta, Stransom's head resting on the woman's shoulder, his limp body sealing a Christ-like sacrifice of charity and compunction in atonement for all the cruel sacrifices of rivalry and unforgiveness. Critics have found the ending of the Altar of the Dead almost embarrassing in the sh suddenness of the shifts in James's rhetorical register, in its narrative dependence upon a miraculous intervention, in the eroticism of its reconciliations, male and female. As a notebook entry from October 24, 1894 reveals, James himself felt somehow betrayed by the story as it unfolded itself beyond his original conceit and authorial control. And yet, there is something arresting, revelatory, and liberating precisely in this break in the veneer of James's customary indecisions and perambulations. As Gerard has argued, quote, the great writer's renunciation of the mimetic desire that has enslaved him to his model always gains symbolic expression in the novel's conclusion to some sort of death and rising, even when the resort to Christian symbolism has no religious significance personally for the writer. For example, an agnostic like Proust. A sacrifice together with the one he has sacrificed, the figure of Stransom, allows James, the writer, finally to begin to move beyond his contest with Oscar Wilde. As Michelle Mendelssohn has amply demonstrated, the works James and Wilde published between the late 1870s and early 1900s reveal a sustained and reciprocal engagement with each other. They were not enemies, but definitely rivals, Mendelssohn writes. They borrowed each other's tropes and themes they were as, as fascinated with each other as they were disdainful of each other. James called Wilde a cad after their first faithful conversation during Wilde's American tour in 1882. He resented the triumphant Oscar in 1895, and their mutual relationship was always decidedly ambivalent. Despite their overt differences, however, Wilde and James shared much. Circle circles and friends, Irish Protestant backgrounds, comparable sexual proclivities, a deep attraction to asceticism, Catholicism, and the theater, concern for commodity, visual, and material culture, and a lifelong fascination with psychology. James's intensifying mimetic competition with Wilde, especially in the late and mid 1890s, went so far as to entrap the American writer in a series of artistic failures. 
To the extent that he wanted to be wild, James could not be himself. Placing the Altar of the Dead first in the volume of the New York edition of his collected works, James honored the story despite its mixed critical reception, perhaps in acknowledgment of the role it had played in his own refashioning. Unlike James's other stories of the ghostly, the occult, and the supernatural, with which it is sometimes awkwardly grouped, the Altar of the Dead is remarkable for its main setting in a Catholic church, its moral miracle, and its saintly intervention from beyond the grave amid the mimetic crisis that was more than fictional. Thank you very much, Sister Ann. Uh, so our second speaker will be Vera Prophet. The title of her talk on Oscar Wilde is Lying as a Sign of Individual Evil in Oscar Wilde's The Picture of Dorian Gray. Vera. Uh, first of all, David, I'd like to thank you for your introduction. Uh, I would like to thank all of those who made time this morning to come here, and I would also like to thank all of those people who organized this conference. Uh, I can imagine the details are endless, and I think those people deserve a nod of appreciation. Beyond the din, the limitless freedom, the proliferating options to make more money and or live longer, what really matters? Do I really matter? These questions, essentially they are one and the same, must be answered. For in the search itself, value is ascribed not only to the principle or person valued, but also and inevitably to the person valuing. For better or worse, we as individuals and as a society are defined by what matters to us. Given the distortions of our age, it may be appropriate to look for moral guidance from those who clearly did not find the right answers, failed to enhance their lives or the lives of those around them. Sometimes we know unequivocally what is right by observing someone do it all wrong. Uh, you see on the screen behind me the characteristics of individual evil. That should tell you two things. There is a discrete phenomenon called group evil, but what we're talking about today is just individual evil. And we will concentrate on the seventh of the eight characteristics. I posted them for you because inevitably, when I complete a presentation like this, someone will come up and say, I missed three and four, what are they? So I thought I would make it a little more accessible for you. Lying, the seventh of the eight characteristics, now invites our mindfulness. Before delving into the inquiry proper, we should note that though the evil individuals encountered in our everyday lives, and we do encounter them, do not necessarily manifest all eight characteristics. All of them lie. There are no exceptions. Dr. Peck chose the title of his treatise well, People of the Lie. All of them will attempt to hide their proclivities, not only from others, but also and primarily from themselves. Dorian Gray proves a grand master of deception. His lies are so numerous and so diverse that without exaggeration, one can speak of an ever so skillfully woven tapestry of lies. A small aside, one evil act does not an evil person make. One lie did not plunge him into hell. It was the sheer number. 
at some point, people cross the line. When viewing the noblesmen's lives as a continuum, a triple-faceted and striking progression, or more accurately, regression, reveals itself. I suspect that most of you here know the story of Dorian Gray, but just to refresh your memories. Oscar Wilde narrates the story of an English aristocrat accorded the tandem privileges of wealth and good looks. Upon completion of his resplendent full-length portrait, Dorian utters a fateful wish. It is granted. While the canvas records not only the ravages of time, but also those of his increasingly serious transgressions, he continues to appear young as well as unsullied. In other words, his face becomes a lie. First characteristic of this continuum. At critical junctures, Dorian Gray makes the decision to continue along this path of deception. He doesn't fall into evil without his cooperation. No one ever does. Over and over again, he elects not to mend his ways. We sometimes wish to excuse people, uh, evil people by saying, well, they didn't know what they were doing. They do know what they're doing. You can't let them off the hook. Number two, as the lies accumulate, so does the gravity of their consequences until these can no longer be reversed. Why does the statute of limitations on murder never run out? Because you can't make it up to the victim. Three, simultaneously, Dorian's mental state deteriorates. He begins with suspicion and progresses to fear and then terror and then madness until the self splits and he even he acknowledges that he leads a double life. Yet he considers himself powerless to reverse or cease his fall from grace. Initially, he wishes to exercise absolute control over his own fate. In other words, to be free at all costs. Gradually, inexorably, he becomes driven. The supposed sovereign evolves into the slave. Therein lies one of the paradoxes of evil. It is exactly the opposite of what he wanted. Let us begin with the most obvious type of prevarication. Dorian verbalizes something in order to deceive the listener. After Sybil's suicide, you have the main characters in front of you. After Sybil's suicide, Basil visits Dorian with the intent of sharing in what he presupposes will be his friend's grief following his fiancee's death. She commits suicide. Instead, the young dandy harbors no lasting regrets. But he does notice the change in the canvas and pulls a screen in front of it. When Basil voices his justifiable outrage and stunned disbelief at such an insult to his exceptional artistic skills, Dorian explains his motivation. The light was too strong on the portrait. That is a very reasonable explanation. Evil people know just how to phrase things. Dorian knows unequivocally that the screen's primary function serves to hide the alteration of the picture. Consequently, the facile statement conforms perfectly to Cecil LeBoc's definition of lying. When we undertake to deceive others, we communicate messages meant to mislead them, to make them believe what we ourselves do not believe. 
Second example, Basil leaves to, uh, plans to leave for Paris on the midnight train and intends to visit with his longtime friend before departing. The two men have known each other for almost two decades. On the morrow, Dar Darian will celebrate his 38th birthday. In early November, around 11 at night, London's weather confirms its reputation. Damp and cold, thick fog hampers visibility. Nevertheless, Dorian does acknowledge, at least to himself, that he recognizes Basil as the artist leaves the nobleman's house after waiting there for several hours. Hallward recognizes his friend, turns and follows him. Basil's detailed explanation concerning his lengthy wait and his immediate travel plans culminate in a single question. Didn't you recognize me? Dorian doesn't wish to converse with Basil and lies permeate virtually every line of his nuanced reply. In this fog, my dear Basil, why I can't even recognize Grosvenor Square. I believe my house is somewhere about here, but I don't feel at all certain about it. I'm sorry you're going away as I have not seen you for ages. With the exception of the final clause, all of Dorian's statements qualify as lies. Basil takes his friend's assurances literally, however, and asks for a brief word. As Dorian doesn't have the slightest inclination to speak to Basil, he says just the opposite of what he means, and in addition, feigns concern for the artist's situation. I shall be charmed, but won't you miss your train? During their rather one-sided discourse, amidst all the queries as well as the accusations Basil leveled against Dorian, yet another type of lie comes to the fore. Basil wonders whether the rumors could possibly be true that his friend has been seen slinking in disguise into the foulest dens in London. You know the novel, though. The verbal lie gains dimension, as it were, and graduates into a situational one. Disguising himself constitutes the first time he reaches for the situational lie. It will only prove the first of many. Later that same evening, Dorian murders Basil. In the midst of devising a strategy to dispose of Basil's remains and thereby create the illusion that the painter is still alive, Dorian fosters yet another duplicitous situation. Both are meant to serve as an alibi for murder. Only too aware of the legal consequences of his act, he understandably fears for his life. Dressed for the inclement weather, he exits his residence after midnight and promptly summons his valet to the door with the pretext that he neglected to take his key. He initiates the exchange with the valet and once again pretending to commiserate. I'm sorry to have had to wake you up, Francis, he said stepping in, but I'd forgotten my latch key. Should the authorities ever be motivated to ask, Dorian notices the policeman patrolling the neighborhood, he asks his drowsy servant to verify the hour when he allegedly comes home. He layers lie upon lie. He also queries Francis if there had been any visitors in the course of the evening. Then he expresses his dismay that he did not have the opportunity to visit with Basil. And as a final insult to his valet's acquiescent nature, Dorian asks if Basil perhaps left a message. Francis dutifully replies, no sir, except that he would write to you from Paris if he did not find you in the club. No doubt, those words do constitute Basil's promise. All else qualifies as lies. Dorian continues weaving his tapestry of deceit ever so skillfully and includes the devoted Francis in his schemes. 
The incisive words of P.D. James ring true. And as a master of detective fiction, she ought to know. Quote, murder is a contaminating crime which change all those who come into touch with it. Second large section. Before continuing these inquiries, it should be noted that all the lies, either verbal or situational or both, serve but a single purpose, to hide the Englishman's deteriorating morals to preserve his pristine image vis-a-vis -vis himself as well as others, to save the self, to save the self from reproach. Notice characteristic eight, they cannot tolerate legitimate criticism. Or as Scott Peck's words say, you utterly dedicated to preserving their self image of perfection they are unceasingly engaged in an effort to maintain the appearance of moral purity. They create an image, and the image is a total variance as to who they really are. You don't get what you see. And once more, the then practicing psychiatrist emphasizes the relentless energy of those he considers evil. They are not pain avoiders or lazy people in general. To the contrary, they are likely to exert themselves more than most in the continuing effort to obtain and maintain an image of high respectability. Following examples should confirm the accuracy of these clinical remarks. The morning after Sybil's death, Basil Howard pays his friend a visit. We heard about the visit earlier. Now you're looking at it from a different angle. And not unexpectedly inquires as to why a screen obscures his acknowledged matters, masterpiece. Where is it? Why have you pulled a screen in front of it? Let me look at it. When Basil asks once more to see his creation, Dorian again refuses. A cry of terror broke from Dorian Gray's lips, and he rushed between the painter and the screen. Though he cannot fathom his friend's negative response to the simple request, Basil harbors no doubt that Dorian's anger exceeds all reasonable limits. One of the characteristics of the evil is that they do not recognize limits. Absolutely refusal of recognizing limits. The lad was actually pallid with rage. His hands were clenched and the pupils of his eyes were like discs of blue fire. He was trembling all over. When the artist blithely assumes that this particular portrait would be including in an upcoming exhibit in Paris, Dorian begins to formulate a counter move to his feeling of terror. Was the world going to be shown as secret where people to gape at the mystery of his life? That was impossible. Something, he didn't know what, had to be done at once. Through some subversive mental maneuvers, Basil, rather than Dorian, confesses the motivation behind his fascination with the portrait, and gradually Dorian's fear subsides. The color came back to his cheeks, and a smile played about his lips. The peril was over. He was safe for a time. These folks become obsessed with their personal safety. Who will find out? Nevertheless, the visit of Basil Hallward necessitates practical steps to ensure that the danger not only be mitigated, but obliterated. The portrait must be hidden away at all costs. He could not run such a risk of discovery again. It had to been mad of him to have allowed the thing to remain, even for an hour, in a room to which any of his friends had access. Dorian formulates a concrete plan. 
The picture will be transported from the library to his former play and schoolroom. The housekeeper produces the key and Dorian places it in his pocket. Given Dorian's escalating degree of apprehension, it is inconceivable that he will ever return the key to Mrs. Leaf. Let me give you a short aside. In order to realize that something needs to be hidden, your conscience is working. We do not feel that something needs to be hidden unless we recognize that we've done something wrong. There is a decision made there, and in the act of hiding, that already gives it away. For a moment, Dorian regrets not telling Basil the motivation for hiding his masterpiece, but that would mean he'd have to acknowledge his sins. The nobleman realizes fully that Basil has his best interests at heart. Not only would the artist have encouraged him to resist Henry's deleterious suggestions, but also the still more poisonous influences that come from his own temperament. And yet Dorian would not or could not resist these destructive promptings. He says to himself, it was too late now. His decision is made. There were passions in him that would find their terrible outlet, dreams that would make the shadow of their evil real. He reiterates his decision to continue his moral decline and its inevitable consequences multiple times. A single act does not an evil person make. Repeatedly, he arrives at the same conclusion. The picture had to be concealed. Again, the accuracy of one of Peck's observations seemed to me verified. The wickedness of the evil is not committed directly, but indirectly as part of this cover-up process. Let me read that again for you. It's kind of a subtle concept, I guess. The wickedness of the evil is not committed directly, but admittedly and indirectly as part of this cover-up process. We all do inappropriate things. We all slip up. We all color outside of the lines. Recognize it change your ways and go on. Don't cover it up. That's evil. It's the covering up that causes the lies to continue. The years pass, and despite the vast array of treasures in his possession, Dorian collects everything from the profane to the sacred, everything from jewels and embroideries to ecclesiastical vestments. They do not help him escape for a season from the fear that seemed to have at times been too great for him to bear. Gradually, inexorably, Dorian Gray seems to be losing more and more control. Unbidden, another of Scott Peck's insights come to mind. Those of psychiatrists agree that evil persons are to be feared. He also steadfastly maintains something we may never have considered. They are also to be pitied. Forever fleeing the light of self-exposure and the voice of their own conscience, they are the most frightened of human beings. They live their lives in sheer terror. To punish evil individuals, we may wish to banish them to hell. Nevertheless, Dr. Peck counsels us not to bother. They need not be consigned to hell. They are already there. Spare your effort.
Though the artist's justifiable outrage, this is now Basil upstairs in the schoolroom looking at the defaced portrait, outrage at seeing the desecrated and hideous picture moves Dorian to tears. He does not heed Basil's repeated pleas to repent. When he is exhorted to look at the results of his consistent dissipation, Dorian forfeits the last vestiges of control over his emotions. Dorian Gray glanced at the picture and suddenly an uncontrollable feeling of hatred for Basil Hallward came over him, as though it had been suggested to him by the image on the canvas, whispered into his ear by those grinning lips. The next lines confirm his utter loss of self-control. The mad passions of a hunted animal stirred in him. Not surprisingly, some moments later, Dorian stabs Basil to death. It's the cover up of the evidence. Dorian can now be designated a murderer. The hunter becomes the hunted. Man turns into beast. The handsome sovereign whose every wish equaled everyone else's command, as Hallward once noted, evolves into the rabid slave. There are moments, psychologists tell us, when the passion for sin, or what the world calls sin, so dominates a nature that every fiber of the body, as every cell of the brain, seems to be instinctive with fearful implications. Men and women at such moments lose the freedom of their will. They move to their terrible end as automatons move. Choice is taken from them, and conscience is either killed or if it lives at all, lives but to give rebellion its fascination and disobedience its charm. For all sins, as theologians weary not of reminding us, are sins of disobedience. When the high spirit, the morning star of evil, fell from heaven, it was as a rebel that he fell. Basil Hallward has been murdered. James Vane has been shot. Ellen Campbell commits suicide. Only one reminder, only one witness, deafening in its muteness, remains to cast aspersions against Dorian. It is the portrait. Were it to be obliterated, it could no longer terrorize him, no longer drive him from place to place, both physically and metaphorically, and no longer function like conscience to him. Yes, it had been conscience. His resolve is clear, he would destroy it. With whatever shred of freedom left to him, he chooses what seems the easier way to regain even a tenuous foothold in a less tormented life. To confess would have been the more obvious, the more difficult path for Dorian. When judged by a single standard, how assiduously he guards the portrait, he represents the diametric opposite of a lazy individual. In fact, these incessant maneuvers virtually consume the entire novel. They commence in chapter seven and only end with Dorian's death on the penultimate page of the novel's final chapter, chapter 20. He cannot give the conscience its due, never has he done so, and he cannot do so now. He cannot give his shadow its due. How can Dorian possibly undertake such a labor-intensive and protracted endeavor? He has evolved into an uncorrectable grab bag of sin. <clears throat> to reverse course would cost way too much. At the very least, he would have to acknowledge that he wasted energy and time. Instead, he asks himself those haunting questions meant to help him evade his just punishment. But this murder, was it to dog him all his life? 
Was he always to be burdened by his past? Was he really to confess? His answer is straightforward. Commensurate with what we expect, absolutely logical within its context, never. His decision is final, for he makes it not once, but many, many times. In destroying his conscience, he will destroy himself. Though not lacking in intelligence, that connection he does not understand, let alone acknowledge. The evil generally do not. The oft quoted but perhaps frequently misunderstood biblical admonition assumes new meaning. To those who want, for those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who will lose their life for my sake will find it. In the unforgettable, the final lines of his only novel, Oscar Wilde summarizes the insight more accurately. Lying on the floor was a dead man, an evening dress with a knife in his heart. He was withered, wrinkled, and loathsome of visage. It was not till they examined the rings that they recognized who it was. In other words, if he would, would, would destroy others, destroys himself. That ancient wisdom, that ancient law, indelibly written on our hearts, even Dorian Gray could only ignore at his peril. Though he attempted to take the law into his own hands, he does not prove the exception. Whatever is stripe or type, live by the lie, you die by the lie. It's as simple as that. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll have only a, a brief time for questions because we're up against the lunch deadline. Uh, so uh, we will end promptly at noon. I ask anybody who'd like to uh, pose a question or make a comment to please come to the microphones available so everybody can hear you. The floor is open. Michal Czeski from the Center for the Thought of John Paul II from Warsaw. I have a question to Anna Stell um, regarding the notion of conversion of uh, uh, René Girard, because strangely enough, uh, although conversion is all probably on all his pages, it is very much under theorized notion. And it is very conceptual, very abstract notion. And I, I, would, like, uh, you, uh, I would like to ask you, how do you see and how can you interpret uh, his image, his understanding of conversion? Uh, and I think that you are leading us into the direction that conversion is not only something abstract, but it's so also something that is corporeal. So it's not intellectual transformation, but it is also corporeal transformation. And I was reminded uh, in, what you're, in, in your talk uh, um, uh, by the notion of wound. So uh, conversion is also healing. It's just going from wound to wonder. So I, I just want you to flesh out uh, that under-theorized notion of conversion of René Girard uh, in your terms. Um. It is under-theorized. Um, he has a, a strong notion of meconocence, mi misrecognition, and, 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 and he acknowledges the power of conversion. But the question is, how do you get from being um, in a state of uh, misrecognition, right, you know, where you actually believe all right, um, in the guilt of the other and, are, are, and not your own, all right, how do you get from there to a state of conversion, right? And um, the really, I th it's, the question has been raised by uh, the Girardians um, um, thinking of, um, um, you know, they actually pose the question to Girard. And the, what, what is necessary is, is a, a, an acknowledgement of grace. Really, there is no other way you can get from one to the other, all right? And, um, and so I think it was, it was probably wrestling with that concern that led Gerard um, forward, you know, in his own thinking, you know, to, in the biblical turn, for instance, um, and then uh, in his work from a kind of cultural analysis to um, a study of the scriptures. Um, it, it, and the wonderful thing about compunction is it's totally unmerited, right? It's a gift, right? A, a, an enlightenment that's sudden, um, that does affect you physically, um, 
I didn't have time to kind of go through the, the whole sort of layout of the theory of compunction, but it begins with that recognition, oh, what have I done, right? And you suddenly know it. And then, um, and then you, you, after you, you've, and you have to work through that feeling because you're, you, you, you're not the person you thought you were, right? It's very disorienting. And then, um, and then you begin to do penance, right? And then you realize as you're striving for virtue and kind of rec 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 um, rectifying you know, some of what you've done, um, you realize you fall into it again, right? And so you're, you're, you're never kind of like totally free. And with, when you get to that third stage, when St. Gregory explains, when you get to that third stage, then you start to be kind of homesick for heaven, right? You know, you just kind of wish, you know, you wish it would make, you're just hoping you're gonna make it to the other shore eventually. And that homesickness for heaven, it takes on a kind of an eros, right? And so the wound, the wound of love, right, that you receive in the moment of compunction and conversion is actually related to the languishing for love of the my Christian mystics. And it's one stream that goes from the moment of conversion to the moment of transformation in, in a mystical union. So it's a, it's a really rich um, notion, and I think it, it, um, it, it's necessary for Gerard, you know, and for um, Gerardian thought, you know, to include something like that. And the beautiful thing about it is it's, it's sacrificial language, right? You know, the, the punctus um, that's offered, so. We have time for one more. Okay, uh, Dr. Prophet, you mentioned that, so he's covering up his sins, right? And, um, and that's, you know, a telltale that he still has a conscience. And I'm just wondering, like, how do we tell if it's conscience that's urging him to do that, or if it's a, like a social consciousness? So like it's just both. a social sensibility. Okay, so like, is the social like influencing his conscience? Can you have, could you have like where you don't have a conscience but you're only acting on social consciousness? I should think so, yeah, yeah. But it removes the illusion that they don't know what they're doing. They do know what they're doing at the beginning. I mean, there comes a point where it, it's progressed so far that they can't tell the good from the bad. He also becomes addicted to a number of opiates. Uh, and all of that influences how you form your judgments. There's a wonderful, well, wonderful is probably the wrong word for it, uh, book uh, written, I think, in 1929 or something by a psychiatrist. And the book is called The Mask of Sanity. And it's case histories of people who you meet every day and who seem as right as right. And then you begin to dig a little bit, and it's the mask of sanity. So this image, the, the, the appearance, they know what's wrong because they're trying to project the contrary image. They wouldn't work so hard at projecting the contrary image if they could just say, this is who I am. I slip up at times, and other times I don't, just like you do. They don't want to be human. They want to be perfect. If they don't want to meet their shadow. We all have a shadow side. We all lose our tempers. We all, if we're in incredible pain, we lash out at people or whatever have you. Uh, the point is nobody is perfect all the time. That's part of the human condition. That's not where it's at for them. There is something missing in them that tells them it's okay. I'm, and that's why they never make any friends because they can't show the friend who they really are. Your friends accept you even if you would rather be reading the newspaper on a Saturday morning than going to a conference. You know, you know what I'm saying? We will have to adjourn for lunch. Thank you very much for coming and thank you to our speakers. <laughs>